Welcome back to Fullerton College Pre-Press. This is Professor Ben Kewitt. We're gonna finish up with a third and hopefully last video on digital image capture here, talking about digital hardware, base, or hardware and software basics. We were talking about CCD and CMOS uh, light sensors included in digital image devices, both in scanners and in digital cameras. How the CCD does a better job with less light, is less susceptible to noise, but at the cost of requiring more electrical power. The CMOS is not as robust and it has more issues with filtering out extra light and getting noise that shouldn't be there. Uh, it has, um, what do you call it, less sensitivity, so it can't do as well in low light, but at the benefit of not using as much battery. Again, the chemical battery revolution had not yet happened when they wrote this slide. And CCDs are coming back into vogue, especially on more high-end cameras, because for a while, battery power was a real issue. Do any of you guys remember the first round of um, iPods? The first time you could amazingly listen to MP3 music, you could take your music with you and you didn't even need a cassette tape or a CD with you. And you could fit it in your pocket or on your sleeve. It was amazeballs, but it only lasted like an hour before it died because the battery was awful. That was pre-lithium ion battery before it really took off and they figured out how to make good long lasting high power output batteries. This is also revolutionized um, remote control aircraft, by the way, because um, now you can have a very small lightweight high power battery and a brushless motor and you can fly RC planes for like an hour with a battery and not need electric, not, not, either, either, not need either a huge heavy battery or need gasoline to run the motor. Anyways, sorry, back to topics. Batteries have gotten better. So CCD is the best bet nowadays since battery power is not as bad as it used to be. Um, note that um, CCDs were earlier technologies and they were used for things like, I don't know, space probes and spy satellites and uh, things like that. So some of the earliest digital photographs I saw growing up were beautiful, beautiful photos that were just starting to come back from this space probe we launched when I was a very, very small child. And as I was growing up, you started to see pictures from Voyager and Voyager 2 the NASA launched out to take pictures of other planets and you got these glorious pictures of Jupiter. In fact, right now, if you close your eyes and you picture in your head images of Jupiter or Saturn, they probably were taken by one of those two satell uh, satellites, two probes. And they use CCD devices to capture. And uh, in order to have enough power to do that and to send these high quality images translating, transmitting all the way back to Earth, they had a nuclear battery on board. That wasn't really a possibility for handheld cameras. So thank goodness for lithium ion batteries, guys. Okay, let's talk about the Bayer filter mosaic. So the Bayer filter mosaic is a uh, array of small colored tiles on top of the light sensor. So any sort of light sensor is not, they're basically all rods, not cones. They're only sensitive to yes light or no light. Uh, not really yes or no. They're, they're, they can sense amounts of light. They only tell you how much light they're seeing. So if you wanna get a color image, you need to have that's right, you guys guessed it, three sensors, a red sensor, a green sensor, and a blue sensor. And you can, come. Uh, each one of those sensors will take a picture and each picture that each sensor takes will be a single channel in Photoshop. I know it's not always done for Photoshop, but that's how it works. One of the sensors sees green light, one sees red, and one sees blue. Um, I've actually experimented with this with my dad uh, doing some kind of guerrilla photography using homemade camera parts. And you can do a color photo by putting a different colored filter in front of a just a lens. You're just doing basically a black box camera. It's like a camera obscura and a lens to focus it onto the back onto some film. You can shoot multiple black and white photos through different colored filters and then develop it to make a color image. It's doable. Anyways, the Bayer filter mosaic is a way of not needing three separate sensors, but using just one sensor. So parts of the sensor are covered with red, green, and blue translucent tiles, respectively. Now, similar to our own eyeballs, there are more green than red or blue because our eyes also see more green than any other color. We're more sensitive to variations in green. Uh, it's a good thing since uh, a good part of our diet for a very long time has been eating plants. And seeing slight different shades of green can tell you if that's good lettuce or rotten lettuce, maybe you should eat it or not. Anyways, so lots of greens and some red and some blue. So 
instead of doing three separate sensors, you have one sensor and different parts of the sensor are covered with these tiny little squares of um, filters, sorry. And that will be what the, uh, the, the camera is able to collect. So it's basically building an artificial human eye by filtering out different colors of light and recording how much of each of those it gets. And the software is gonna put those three different images it's taking together into one image. All right, guys, let's talk resolution. Some important stuff here. People like to bandy about the phrase megapixel. It sounds really cool. Megapixels, how many megapixels are in your picture? So there's always something they use for selling, by the way, when they're selling you a digital phone now, digital phone, a camera, a phone with a digital camera built in. They always talk about the number of megapixels it can have. And well, one megapixel is a million pixels, but we're not talking linear here. No, no, we're not talking how many pixels per inch in one line like we do, we're talking about resolution, like print resolution or DPI, PPI stuff on your computer screen. Oh no, megapixels is an area calculation, length times width. So it's not how many pixels in an inch are there, it's how many pixels are there at all and or how many are there in a square inch, which is a lot more of a number, but not, to, not necessarily a lot more data. So two megapixels, which sounds kind of impressive, is only about a four by six inch picture at 300 DPI. A lot of those little point and shoots you get for holiday snaps, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, those guys all come at, or a lot of them come at two megapixels because it's a cheaper sensor, it's less money to do, less software necessary, less memory for the SD chip to remember your photos. And that's only built to take little holiday pictures, the little ones you print out or used to go get developed in little four by sixes. So you can put them in your little book and remember your, your vacation. Four megapixels gets you about eight, eight by five. Six megapixels gets you 10 by seven. And 12 megapixels sounds like a lot, but it's still only 14 by nine at printable resolution. So keep this in mind, refer to this. Uh, if you're looking at a camera for the number of megapixels, remember you need quite a bit to take a decent photo for printing. Ooh, another soapbox, one of my favorites too. Optical and interpolated resolution. So as we talked about on scanners, scanners really only have optical resolution. And optical resolution is how much information can the digital camera actually capture? How many sensor bits are on that Bayer mosaic? How much is it able to actually see? And this also includes things like zoom. How far can you actually zoom in on a picture? What's your telephoto uh, capabilities? And real world optical zoom and real world resolution has to do with the lenses themselves. How much focal depth how much distance can you create between the lenses to focus at farther away things or at closer in things? That's true. Interpolated resolution is a sales pitch and it is nothing but a sales pitch. You have to be careful when you're buying a camera or comparing cameras that you look at this. This is something that has fooled most people who buy these things because it will tell you how many megapixels it has, but sometimes they're not actually megapixels that the camera is capturing Sometimes, sometimes instead it's interpolating them. And what does that mean? It artificially adds pixels. That means, hold on a second, sorry, my uh, vacuum is coming my way and he's gonna be loud. So in order to help you think that your camera is better, they use interpolated resolution. And that is a way of taking what it sees and making more pixels out of what's already there. So let me give you some food examples here. Imagine you have a box of cookies and there's like 10 cookies left, but you need to feed 20 people. So what you do is you break the cookies in half and each person needs half a cookie. That's kind of what's going on here. Instead of getting the whole pixel, the whole image, well, you're not getting half, but it's doubling the pixels by cutting them in half. So you're not actually getting, let me zoom in on this thing so you can see the awful difference. The optical on top here, Um, excuse me, computer, what are you doing? The optical resolution is a little blurry. It's as big as it can be, but the interpolated resolution looks a lot more blurry because it's not actually capturing more information. It is only 
you know, you show it a pixel and it says, I see two pixels, wink, and it puts two pixels there instead. It's cheating and it's a sales pitch and you should not believe it. And in fact, this is one of the problems that leads to people giving you bad cell phone pictures to try and print. That they're sure are gonna be great because they have interpolated resolution. And interpolated resolution actually looks okay on the computer screen too, but you can't fool a printing plate. Okay, data storage. This is obviously a little bit outdated on this image here because in my own phone next to me, I have a 32 gigabyte uh, card and my cameras all have like 64 to 256 gigabytes. Um, you can get terabyte if you really want to spend the money on it. Anyways, flash memory and micro drives store these things. They're small, they're light, they store a lot of data. These things are flash memory is actually overtaking traditional memory in computers. They're using this more and more because it's a good way of storing things. It's more stable than some other methods and it's a really good way to do it. Let's talk file format for the last five minutes of our video here. So common formats. Yeah, JPEGs we've talked about previously. TIFFs we've talked about previously. RAWs and DING, sorry, DNG. So we've already talked about JPEGs and TIFFs. JPEG, again, stands for a Joint Photographic Experts Group and it's named after the people who invented it. Uh, I actually knew one of the guys, no, I grew up with one of the guys who invented the JPEG. He was my friend's dad. Uh, it's what happens when you grow up down the street from Caltech. You may not be smart, but you're smart adjacent. Your neighbors are really smart. Anyways, so people from Canon, Xerox. Um, by the way, the fact that those two work together on this is unbelievable and different computer agencies all work together to invent the JPEG as a way of getting around early computer limitations on showing images. Moving on, raw. <clears throat> raw is called digital negatives sometimes um, because it is basically just giving you raw sensor data. It's exactly what did the digital sensor see. Here it is, unaltered, no compression, no color adjustment, no saving type that does things for how it's remembered. This is just pure sensor data. And later on, when you go to the Photoshop side of things, then you start to tweak it and you can adjust things. This way, if you want to do stuff like you're developing film, like if you've ever done an art class with actual film, you've actually developed it, you have that kind of control in Photoshop if you shoot from RAW. If you already saved as a JPEG or a TIFF, you've already lost some of that control because it's already applied a color space and it's already applied some um, compression to it, even if it's lossless. So this is untouched sensor data, it's raw. So again, it gives you the most data and the most ability to make changes, the most control. <clears throat> so you're able to adjust what the white point is, what the contrast is gonna be and do a lot of things. And basically you're developing it as if you're developing physical film. There's also DNG that Photoshop, uh, Photoshop that Adobe tried to launch in 2004. It didn't really catch on all that big. You can sort of do it, and some cameras will shoot in DNG. It's digital negative, not raw, but actually legitimately called digital negative. And it's very similar to raw and it's used in Photoshop and Lightroom. It's the same concept as raw. Both of them are trying to give you unaltered sensor data that you can then manipulate and create the image the way you were hoping to capture it. Let's finish up by talking about unsharp masking. If you scan something, you're naturally getting something called softness. To get the best looking reproduction, you need to use something called unsharp masking, which is hiding the softness. Which is kind of like me wearing baggy clothes to, so you guys don't notice I have a giant gut, but you can't really see that in Zoom anyways, can you? So images are captured soft because the, when the continuous tone gets converted to pixel, it's done by sampling on a grid pattern and that means that there are some averages that have to be done. At some point, kind of like when we looked at that JPEG, uh, my video on JPEGs in the last chapter, you might have noticed that even when it's a good quality image at the edge of something, there's going to be some weird middle colors because at some point, you're going to get a detail that's too fine for the pixel to be correctly colored on. It's going to have to be, if you have a black line on a white background, at some point in uh, a digital image, there's going to have to be a gray point between the two because at some point there's going to infinity on how small an edge should be. You're going to reach a point where it's smaller than the pixel. And the only way to show that difference between the black and the white without it looking like a jagged edge is to have some gray between the two. 
and that makes the images soft. That's just the most extreme example it can come up with. It also gets soft when you convert to halftone dots because halftone dots break up the image even more. So what do we do? Unchart masking. Unchart masking looks for places with high light to dark contrast and increases the contrast. It makes the edges darker and the other parts next to it brighter. So we are back at one of my favorite things ever, Spitfire Mark V. Let me zoom in on this for us so we can see what unsharp masking looks like. So you can see around the edge of the airplane, you can kind of already see there's kind of a lightish color. Let's zoom in more. Do you see how there's a white line at the edge of the aircraft? That's not there in real life. It's not actually reflecting light along. If you look at where it is on the plane, that's on the underside of a curve. It's not gonna be reflecting light back at you from underneath there. You can see the light reflection actually happens on the top of the vertical stabilizer over here. So that white outline is the result of unsharp masking. That's the digital image capture device or when the file was saved, trying to make it look crisper and cleaner, it increased the contrast between the edge of the plane and the sky behind it. That is unsharp masking in action. So to finish out here, there are three different things you could do in unsharp masking. You could be automatic or you could do it manually. There's a radius, which is how far from the edge do you want to change things? The closer you get, the crisper it'll look, but it can also look kind of artificial. If it looks kind of like it's been outlined, it'll have a black line around it or a white line, depending. The amount, how much are you going to apply? You can do more or less of an extreme. Uh, the less you do, the softer the image is, but the less weird and obvious it is. Uh, honestly, the correct answer is typically subjective to the image itself of how it's going to look. And the threshold is, which is, when do you apply it? The threshold is saying, what is my limit? At what point do I say that color is so much darker than the color next to it that we need to increase it to make sure it looks sharp? And that's what that is. So low thresholds means there's less excluded and high thresholds means more is excluded from the lower contrast. So you're trying to make sure that you're going to use the right amount of contrast. Again, it's not None of these are a hard and fast thing. You'll notice there's no answer on this. It doesn't say use this radius, use this amount, use this threshold. It's just telling you these are the three adjustments you can make in unsharp masking. Use them wisely. All right, guys. Thanks for listening. Until next time.